Hello everyone and welcome back along to the channel. Today we're going to be having a bit of a look at one of the biggest rugby competitions of this year starting up this weekend. That's right, it is the Six Nations and it's said to be a cracker one as well. For the first time they've adopted the bonus point rule as well which will make this competition just a little bit more interesting as well as teams vie for those also crucial bonus points going into their final table standing. So we're going to have a look at the teams, of course, the Six Nations going into this competition. We're going to have a look at the strength of those teams, the weaknesses, and some key thoughts I've got about the team heading into the competition. Of course, things can all change, injuries can happen, players can be missing from action, but we're going to have a look at the squads as they're named for the start of the competition. So let's get stuck straight into it and have a look at our first team, which of course will be defending champions England. So the English team, of course, winners in 2016, looking to go back to back for what has been a bit of a rare thing to do for teams in recent time as well. The key things about this side is they have three new caps coming into the team this season. Two of them coming in the forwards and one of them is in the backs. It is Alex Luzowski coming in as a reserve back. It is Nathan Cat. Um, the reserve prop and of course Mike Williams the flanker coming in for their first possibly first caps in the Six Nations so they've brought in some youth as well they've brought in some fresh faces but what I think is going to be key for this English team is a number of little factors most notably the return of a couple of players who we didn't see near the end of last year and really were star players especially the first one which we will say Haskell. Haskell was huge for England last year and we remember back to the Australian series where he was amazing throughout those test matches and he has really been a leader out from the front in the side uh, performance wise he has been amazing I think him back in the team is going to be a huge boost for this English side. Uh, Maro Atolje, another one back in the team as well. Very young player, but already proving that he may well be up to international standard with good numbers as well. Coming back into the English side, very versatile, second row, back row, and a very, very talented player as well. Also, goes without saying, really, champions in 2016, you really think they have to be favourites, undefeated in 2016 as well. Players coming back, key players as well, like we spoke about in Haskell and Atolje. Of course, they have to have some weaknesses, though. Every team has weaknesses. And for England, I'm going to pick on their leadership. It's pretty clear that they're most likely going to be picking Hartley to be the captain for the 2017 season. But even Eddie Jones has spoken about the fact as well that they don't really have many players who could really step into that role or even challenge Hartley for that role if necessary. The future obviously looks a bit bleak when it comes to leadership in the English team. Another thing I'll just mention briefly is that there is a few key players at the moment heading into the first round of the Six Nations who are currently under those 50-50 injury clouds. Could be ready, might not be ready. Will they be 100%? Do they need them 100%? That is always the big risk. Going into these tournaments, you need your best players on top of their game. England, they have a few that are under a cloud. Will it hurt them? Maybe not. Maybe these guys will be ready to go, but it's still a bit of a risk if they're not at the peak of their game. All in all, though, England look pretty good, and you'd have to be a silly man to bet against them at this early stage heading into round one. Okay, so that's Smash through England. Let's have a look at the second team we're going to be talking about, which will be Ireland. One of the amazing sides from 2016. They achieved some incredible things, and they head into the 2017 Six Nations with a big head of steam, with belief of a possible great season as well. Themselves, they've picked up three new caps, Andrew Conway, Rory, and Niall Scale, both, all three, I should say, coming from Munster, who have a huge representation of Irish players under 20s, all sorts. The, the Munster side really has become a breeding ground of the Irish national team with just piles of players leaving on international duty. It's hard to imagine that they can continue on playing in their club competition, the Pro 12, without all these guys in the team. Really shows the amazing depth that they have at that club. But we're not here to talk about Munster. We are talking about Ireland, who have additionally added three new caps, all coming from Munster. 
So the strengths of this Irish team, we saw many of these strengths last season as well, and most notably it will be their back row that I think is going to be the most important to this side. Another area that Ireland need to make sure they look after is scrum half. We know Conor Murray is one of the best number nines in the game at the moment, but he needs that protection to be able to play his game to the best. All his forward pack and even backs if they're in the position need to make sure he gets undisrupted clean ball. That is going to be the most important thing to get Conor Murray into the game. So the back row, very much a focal point of my strengths of this Irish team. If they do their job well, if they continue that strong running, which they did last year as well, they look after their scrum half, which probably is something they might need to focus on because that is where teams will attack them. If they can shut down Murray, there's most likely they can really disrupt the rest of their back line. The strength as well to Ireland would be the good strength they have on the bench. A lot of players coming off, pushing for starting positions and really putting pressure on and creating that competition in the team that always relates to stronger performances and making players just continuously get better and better because they don't want to lose their spot on the team. It's the experience, getting key players in there and making sure there is that healthy environment of competition throughout the team. On the other half, of course, there always has to be weaknesses as well. For Ireland, you've got to say it's that number 10, fly half. Sure, they have Sexton who is world class, but goodness me, how often has Sexton played recently? Not very much at all. He's taken a lot of injury and he's been out for a lot of time over the most recent few years as well. Sure, if he's fit for all of their matches, then it won't be an issue. But if he's not, then they're going to have to rely on the likes of Jackson. They're going to have to look to the likes of Madigan and bring him into the team. They're going to have to go to someone else, back up further along the way. And then it really becomes a problem if they cannot keep two of their best in the team. Sure, Jackson will be great off the bench, but they really need Sexton at least starting in their matches this year. If they're going to alleviate that weakness away from their game, they need it to be right there in the number 10 jumper. Other than that though, really it looks a strong Ireland team that you would imagine would push hard in this year's Six Nations, but are they good enough to go all the way? So thirdly, we're going to have a look at Wales now, a team that I think is going to perform much better than they probably have over the last 12 months previous. So their Six Nations last year was pretty decent, but their touring away was extremely poor. They suffered a lot of injuries throughout the year and their performances didn't really reflect how good their team was and they showed that really under that top level of players that they have, it's really a soft underbelly for that Welsh team. Amazingly, they have picked up a huge amount of new players. Five new players coming into this Welsh squad. There's Thomas Young from Wasps. They also have Ollie Cracknell coming in from Ospreys. They have Steph Evans coming in from Scarlets, Owen Williams from Leicester, and Ashton Hewitt from the Dragons. They also have two players from previous squads that didn't actually play, so they're uncapped essentially, but still have been in a squad before. Of course, those are Alan Davies and Rory Fortin. So a lot of new faces and experience in international level. Even if you've got a couple of caps, it's still extremely inexperienced. Of course, they have a new captain, which is probably the biggest thing about this Welsh squad. Um, as Sam Warburton's gone, Alwyn Jones has come in and taken the armband from him. I think that is good for one man, and that is Sam Warburton, often weighed down by the expectations of the team and, and of the country, Wales. It, you'd imagine that this is going to be almost like a release for Sam Warburton, who, you know, a few years ago, I'm talking quite a few years ago, when he first burst onto the scene, he was one of the best open side flankers going around the game. He's fallen away, injury, pressures, all that sort of thing has come up against him, and in competition, to be fair, from around Wales as well, has probably really kicked him in the guts a bit. How do you not select the captain, things like that. Now he's only got one thing to worry about, and that is to win the games, to perform his duties more than anything else. Doesn't matter if they take a shot at goal or kick to the corner, he's just got to worry about getting to that ruck, throwing the ball over, making the tackles. That's what Sam Warburton needs to do. And the release of that armband, I think, will help him 
There's a replacement Elwin Jones. I, I mean, we don't even need to talk about it. We know he is an amazing leader. He's an amazing player. He thrives on having the armband on as well. He's a proud Welshman, and you can imagine that this will only boost his game up another level. And I think all round for Wales, this would be a very, very good thing. Another thing for Wales that I'll mention quickly is that for the first time in quite some time, I think they've seen the Welsh squad being named is that they have all their big names really all together for once. I mean, there's no real massive injuries. Most of that core is once again back. I'm looking at the half pennies, the Norths, the Davies, and the Roberts, especially in the back line, are all there together. There's the Falatel still at number eight, will be playing again as well. You know, the big names, the Alan Wynn Jones, all those big Tippericks, a Warburton, they're all fit, they're all there, and they're all going to be in the squad. For the first time in a long time that I can remember, of course, Dan Bigger as well. If he can produce form that we've seen from Wales in the World Cup and him, you know, this Welsh side could be quite good despite not having the best build-up in 2016 after their last Six Nations performance. Now, the only thing I'm going to pick on about this Welsh side is not really anything to do about the Welsh side. It's more the fact of something that is weakening this Welsh team, and it's something that is referred to as Gatlin's Law, the wild card law about players who are based outside of Wales. Now, I can see both sides of the story. I can see what was trying to be achieved with this about how only three players outside of Wales, the Welsh clubs, could be selected from France or, or wherever they may be. But really, is that really picking the strongest squad for Wales? Or is this good for Wales? Does it bring more of the best players? We can see it already has brought more of the best players back into Welsh clubs, which is fantastic. And if that continues and all of the top flight Welsh players are all together, does that make the team better? Does it see them all playing at a high level like they need to be? The top 14 or the Pro 12, really too much difference there whatsoever, really. But in the end, playing together in Welsh clubs seems to be the answer that they're looking for. Will it produce results for them? We will see in the coming years. But at the moment, it is still cutting a couple of players out from selection that could have made the squad even stronger. It's really the only one thing you'd pick on about this team that is holding them back from their full potential. If Wales going to compete this year, they need to keep their key players injury free. And of course, they need to keep working on that continuity that seemed to lack throughout the second half of 2016, where it just seemed like something was missing from that team clicking. But other than that, on paper, Wales don't look that bad. Next up, we make our way over to Scotland. We see the Scottish team named for the Six Nations also has some new names in it. Two new caps, Simon Burnham and Cornell Dupree. Both of them foreign players who have gained residency and permission to play for the Scotland national team as well. So, of course, the first one, Simon Burnham, the New Zealand-born prop coming in to the Scottish team and the prayer, the South African under 20 flanker. So, you know, these guys are decent enough to be playing for the South African under 20s. No mean feat whatsoever. That's got to be respected, definitely. Young player and good enough to play at that level. Definitely worth like taking a look at for Scotland, who have really built their team up quite nicely from imports and just being picky and choosy and getting the best players they can. You know, it doesn't matter where they're born. If they're proud of representing a nation, that's all you really need. Eligibility laws are always something that are, are very, very contentious as well. But at the moment, they're doing what's legal. They're strengthening their team. And you can't really blame them for it if that's how you've got to get it done. Now, the big strength here that could be and should be for Scotland will be the new coach with new ideas and really new targets for the team. You can't get too stale and Scotland have decided it's time to look for someone different. It's been talked about for a long time. Gregor Townsend, he's been in and around the squad for a number of years now, touted as the next coach for Scotland. He's finally made it, he's finally there and now he has to really make it pay and make the difference to this Scotland team. Ever since the Rugby World Cup, Scotland has been getting even better and better. Their young talent has just progressed quite nicely. I'm talking really the Finn Russells of that team. 
We talk a lot about Hugh Jones as well, the man, former South African as well, who has come into the side and, and made quite a mark for himself as well at international level. But they need to continue that progress if they're going to keep making their way up that ladder that they have done over the last couple of years. And impressively enough, they've done a pretty good job of it so far, Scotland as well, narrowly losing to Australia a few times and really pushing most of the teams have come up against fairly well, scoring a lot more points as well, a lot more tries, which that's the way the modern game's going, isn't it? Score points by scoring tries, that's how you generally win the games. The real weakness, though, for the Scots will be just that real lack of those world-class players that they need. They've got Stuart Hogg at the back. They've got a few that are coming up through. Could be possibly world-class players. Maybe not. We will only find out in the next few years. But what they need is to keep developing these youngsters. I'm talking, you know, again, those Finn Russell players. Need to keep pumping them through. Get them up to that next level. Get the help out there for one of the best fullbacks in the game, Stuart Hogg, who needs to keep at that level. And he needs more players to make this team as good as it can be at his level. He needs to be almost the benchmark for Scotland to raise all their players to be at his level of world class so they can actually attack these six nations and could really be a good threat as well so i'm really itching to see some good performances from scotland and see them take that next step like they've done over the last couple of seasons as well and progress up and really challenge the likes of england the likes of ireland and make it really hard to go to scotland as well and take points away from there that's what their target has to be and if a new coach you know Teams won't know what to expect from the Scots as well, which is where they've got to attack this year especially and make the most of that factor. So only a couple of teams remain now and we make our way to the French squad who also have four new caps. So everyone is throwing the new names into the bag for 2017 as normally goes. There's been a few months, a couple of months since we last saw international rugby and it's time to get those form players into the teams. So the four new names for France are as follows. Prop, Mohamed Bougandi. Second rower, Arthur Aturia. Back rower, Fabian Sanconi. And fullback, Jeffrey Pallas to join the team. So four new names for the French, but you've got to say, what was 2016 for France, if not a very strange and a poor year for a team like France that you expect to do so much better than they did. Of course, there's got to be some strengths for a team. You can't just rip into these guys and say it's all doom and gloom and bad. But there's a change of direction for the French. And you've seen it last year especially as well in that last test match versus the All Blacks where defence was king for them. And I think that's going to be good because France are often a team that play the game of scoring more points than their opposition and not worrying about stopping them. They just want to score, 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 score. And if it's fast as the other team scores, they can get back to halfway. Do they do that? I'm not saying they do that, but often seems the case that whatever the quickest route is to score more points is where they go. A big focus on defense here from the new coach since the World Cup, and he's made a quite remarkable difference as well. What they do need to work on, however, and real weakness for this team, is going to be their attack. So no Wesley Fofana for them in the, the Six Nations this year, which is going to be a huge loss. We all know how good Wesley Fofana is. To not have him means they lose a lot of their attacking flair. They can still counter-attack quite well. They can still do the charge up through the forwards and the likes of that. But really, their backline attack is going to be missing something for this season's games. On paper, when you look at this team, it's, it's a fairly good team. You look at the players, how they perform at club level, you've got to say it's, it's a decent side. But what they're really going to struggle with, like I said before, their attack, scoring points though. They just didn't seem to be able to score enough points last year, averaging a fairly low amount around the 20 mark, which isn't going to be enough to take out a good team like the England, Wales, Ireland, even Scotland for that matter will give them a good run for their money, a decent attacking side, scoring more tries. So that's what France need to look at. It's great to defend, but you don't win a rugby game without scoring points. We're not playing football. We're not going for a nil or draw. You've got to score something, and it's kind of like the natural ability of the French has been conflicted with the training thing of defense for this team. If they can just get a good blend of the two, France could be dangerous, like I said, on paper, a very, very good side, a quality side, quality players, 
but they're just not finding that nice blend at the moment between the two. So if they can find that and then play the full 80 minutes as well, not asking too much for the French, they've got a lot to work on, but if they can do all that together, they're not far away from being back to the glory days of France where they could beat anyone on the world on any given day. So French are good enough, but are they going to be able to apply these new techniques of the defense orientated game and still be able to show that French flair that that cliche crap isn't it cliche crap I'm not even going to say the I word or the C word not swearing or whatever but you know what I mean um, not going to mention those because French rugby has progressed from those days and they are, they're gone in a different path and I think they're good enough and professional enough to step it up learn the new style of game and become a world force yet again and not too far away. I think their team has definitely got the quality. They just need to work together on that game plan. And just gel as it is. And just get it together. And finally, last but not least, will be the Italians. Now, the poor old Italians, they just can't seem to really buy a win in the Six Nations without too much hassle. But you've got to look at what they're coming off in 2016. A win against South Africa. Now... You may argue that that doesn't have the weight anymore that it used to have, but still, a win over South Africa is a win over South Africa. The record books say Italy won and South Africa lost, and that's all you need to know. It is one of the best teams in the world losing to Italy, and they'll be taking that to heart completely and taking it all the way into this new season. They have a new coach, of course, Conor O'Shea, coming into the team, and a, he's a coach that definitely knows how to bring the best out of these players as well. And I expect to see some improvements of this Italian team with him at the helm. They have a couple of new caps. They have a front rower and a second rower, which are named Dario Cistellini. He is the front rower. And it is Federico Ruzza, the second rower, who will be joining the squad as a new cap. So the former Harlequins boss is making a few changes to the team here for Italy, but still the same things remain and the same problems but the same strengths remain for this Italian team. I feel the four pack will probably do a good enough job competing with the other teams, but what is probably going to be their biggest strength is that now they have a decent coach set up now, of course, with the new coach there, a couple of decent assistants with them as well, which hopefully you'd imagine should progress this team. We, I, I highly doubt we'll see results this year, but we talk about it every year, don't we? Italy could get better. We hope they get better. We hope they improve and start to actually win a few Six Nations games more than they are currently, but it's going to take time. You've got to do the hard work, get the right guys in the job, then hope that it takes effect. You've got to hope that this is the right combination this time for Italy. Their weakness is their strength. Their weakness is the fact that they have one man who is class, Sergio Prise. He is one of the best number eights in the world, and the weight of Italy, once again, like it is every year and every time Italy come running out the shirts on, is fully on his shoulders. It is right on his shoulders. The whole weight of that team and the competition is really pivotal on how Prise performs. He is one of the best. But you've got to get players like Scotland again. We talk about it. You've got to get players who are good enough to step up to that level that those players are on. They need more Parises and other positions if they're going to be competitive. A lot of youngsters have come into this Italian team recently, but they're just not getting to that level. There's some that have progressed, but they're progressing to an all right level, but they're not going to set the world on fire, and it's a real shame for the Italians that they just don't have that injection of great players coming through the ranks. But of course, it's still early days for a few of them, so we can still live in hope that they will unearth a few gems in the next couple of years as they continually search for that next Italian superstar to come through that team. But all in all, they did beat South Africa, and you've got to keep that in mind, um, that they will build on that and hopefully push that through their game and take some real notes and and the strengths of that game and how they progress through that end of year tour time and, and hopefully um, portray it into the Six Nations. And also hopefully they won't need to rely on rain like the Italians always seem to do. If it's raining, they can revert to that old school forward um, plan of just that dirty rugby game 
in the mud and just play it really close to the heart and and if that's what it takes for them to win then all well and good but you've got to play to every condition and at the moment that's all that really favors the poor old italians but hopefully we see some more from them very soon but that does wrap us up hopefully a quick look at the 2017 six nations the timer doesn't say so but hopefully it won't be too long i'm trying to keep these all a bit shorter for this year's rugby games as well so you all don't have to uh, watch through too long of me rambling away about the teams but if you want to know who i think is going to finish where well i've already told you i've already done it because the order that i talked about these teams is the order that i think they're going to be finishing so if you didn't catch what order we did them in you're going to have to go back and find out who i did first second third fourth fifth and sixth of course the italians i did last so i'll give you that one for free but you know let me know what your thoughts are who do you think is going to take out the six nations in 2017 who is going to be good enough who is going to be the standout? Who's going to be the superstar? What new talents are going to emerge? What are we going to learn? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. As always, this is just my opinion on the matter. So feel free to release your own opinions in the comments below and let me know what you think. And hopefully, it'll be a great year for Six Nations Rugby out there in 2017. I'll be back in with some more Super Rugby previews as that's only a few weeks from getting underway as well. And we'll have some action coming from Six Nations on Rugby Challenge 3 in the coming days as well. Hope you all enjoy your rugby in the international season kicking off in the Northern Hemisphere this weekend. And until next time, thank you all for watching. Hope you've enjoyed and I'll see you all later. Until then, take care.